So um, our work is inspired by what we find. We actually don't set out to, to uh, go after targets or anything. We really stumble across stuff, and we get excited by it, and we want to make things out of it. And our work's always really been a hybrid of, of things that we, we find, we appropriate, uh, uh, we steal, whatever word you want to use, and things that we've made ourselves and mixed together. Um, It was, only, it was in 1991 that uh, we finally uh, stepped on the wrong big toe. And uh, we had gotten a hold of a recording of a top 40 disc jockey named Casey Kasem. And how many of you know who he is? OK. I'm realizing as the years go by, and Casey's kind of slowly going off the map, that this story is going to mean less and less to people who are under the age of, I don't know, 25. But um, Casey Kasem is also the voice of Sk Shaggy and Scooby-Doo. <laughs> That's him. And um, he's also an interesting figure. He's an animal rights activist. He was arrested for um, protesting uh, nuclear testing. And he he's, uh, was one of the few Hollywood celebrities in 91 that came out against the first invasion of Iraq. But Casey Kasem was uh, doing um, his voiceover uh, takes in the studio for his radio show. And when you do this, you do a lot of different uh, takes over and over to try to get the best ones. And uh, something was going wrong that day. I don't know what. But Casey just goes ballistic in the studio, totally apeshit, uh, and uh, is incredibly harsh and cruel and nasty to the engineer who's uh, uh, recording him. And these tapes we got a hold of. Someone gave these to us at, uh, after a show we did in Portland, Oregon. And of course, nowadays, if these tapes surfaced, they would be all over the, the, the web. Everyone would be downloading them. And we never would have made this record, because part of what also inspired us was we were the only people who had them, just about the only. You know, It was a special find, some secret thing that we've got. So these tapes were so funny, we said, wow, we've got to do something with this material. This is great. What can we make out of this? Well, he happened to be introducing a new song by a band called U2. And we thought, huh, well, maybe we should have him. What would make sense? He should be talking over a little bit of music from U2 and then have it kind of break down and dissolve into this other, you know, him messing up and, and uh, having a bad day. And, and the whole project kind of grew from there. Um, and it's for reasons which I don't quite understand. We, we, we were always creating things where we, wish we're, we weren't worrying about other things that other people might realistically say, geez, you're nuts. Why are you doing that? You know, you can't do that. Uh, but for us, these just seem like really good ideas. And to the, the degree to which we sensed that maybe we're doing something you kind of, sort of shouldn't do, that just made it more interesting. That there's something I think I said uh, when I was here a few years ago, that there are always those artists who like to work within a tradition and expand upon that. And there are those artists, I think they're a smaller number, but they're drawn like moths to a flame. You know, they're drawn toward... Um, wanting to do things that they feel like they're kind of not supposed to do, you know, pushing at the edges of stuff. And that's precisely the area where they get the most creative spark. They're the most excited. They get the most energy. And, and, or in, in our case, we think it's the funniest, too. So um, we, um, what else did we do in this project? We uh, did everything that, everything bad. Uh, so it's ended up turning into a single. Side one was a cover version of the U2 song, I Still Haven't Found What I'm Looking For. We had a sort of dramatic reading of the lyrics uh, by a member of the group, uh, uh, David, also known as the Weatherman, who kind of butchered Bono's lyrics and altered them. Now, when you do a cover version of a song, you don't have to get permission. But if you alter the lyrics, you've got to get permission. So we did that. We used a very 30-second chunk of the U2 song as the uh, beginning intro. Um, of course, didn't clear that. Um, there's uh, bad words in this, and that was, uh, they didn't like that either. But the, the final thing that really brought it to the attention of Island Records that really made them decide to nail our asses was that we, we ended up uh, making the, the record look like this. <laughs> and um, we thought, this, is, this would be funny. Uh, it's, it's confusing. It looks like a, a new album from U2 that's called Negative Land. <laughs> <laughs> and, and we like the idea that you put this in a record store and people are confused. We like the idea of creating this, this at the moment of consumption. Uh, you're, 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 you're not quite sure what's going on here. And Negative Land's always been interested in, in creating that, that, that kind of moment of, what, the, what, what, what is this? Or, they can't do that, but they are. How is this possible? And we've been able to do that a few different times in our, our career. And it, it's, it's very thrilling to get to do. 
We, were, we also assumed people would figure it out, but never underestimate uh, the inattentiveness of the average American. <laughs> because it turned out that places like Tower Records was putting up entire window displays of this record when it came out, <laughs> um, thinking it was the new U2 album. Uh, um, very funny. So um, uh, we also, of course, were referencing that U2 stole their name as well. This is the U2 spy plane on the cover, uh, famously shot down in 1960 uh, with the pilot Francis Gary Powers aboard. And um, so this thing came out, and within 10 days, we uh, were hit with a 200-page lawsuit. Uh, we were also on a record label at the time called SST Records, so both Negative Land and SST were sued big time. They sued us for, oh, they sued us for, of course, copyright infringement, trademark infringement, uh, fraud, you know, deceiving U2 fans into buying our record as a money making, that it was a big money making scheme, uh, for defamation of character, for associating this foul language with the clean cut image of the band U2, for failure to <laughs> obtain, you know, proper licenses when you're doing a cover, I don't know the right language, but we didn't, you know, get permission to alter the lyrics and do that. So they did what good lawyers do, you just throw everything you can at somebody to, uh, to nail them. Interestingly enough, the, um, the, rec the actual copy of the U2 single that resulted in this lawsuit was purchased in Athens, Georgia. And I finally, years later, tracked it down to uh, a particular store. And I found out that, um, well, I kept thinking, who the hell is in Athens, Georgia, who has anything to do with U2? What's the deal? And I thought, wait a minute, REM. They're buddies. Well, the story, and, I w and, uh, and Burtis Downs, who is REM's manager, lawyer, advisor guy, I don't, is he here? Mr. Downs, I have to ask you if you are the man who bought that record. Well, <laughs> fuck you. <laughs> fuck you. Well, fuck you. Yeah, well, I, but thank you also. Thank you very much because I, I uh, but yeah, I, I actually did a lot of work. And, but I believe that. Yeah. Well, the story was that what you then the story I heard was that you said something like, "Oh, they think this is funny. How well we'll show them a thing or two. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not that kind of guy. You know, yeah. Most people don't be well, the people you, I ended up getting this one point speak to uh, Mike Mills and Michael Stipe about it, and both of them never had any. They said, "No, there's no way that our guy Burtis Downs could have anything to do with you guys getting nailed." <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> sure. <laughs> well, no, it costs us. I make below poverty level income. I still do to this day, and it costs us forty-five thousand dollars. And it took about four years of our lives, every single, literally every single day, for four years of our lives. But because of our interest in the media and all of these issues, when we were sued, we realized we had been handed an incredible opportunity. Not just a, it wasn't just having our baby stolen from us. It wasn't just something terrible and upsetting. That because we were connected to the world's largest rock band, we had a chance to address the media and try and talk about a larger issue, which is that corporations are con con claiming omnipotent, godlike control of our culture. That we should only consume it and uh, uh, what, they, what they put out for us to consume. We shouldn't respond to it in any way. So in 91, these issues were just not on the table. And it kind of felt like Negative Land was the canary in the coal mine, that we had been handed our mission from God. And we needed to sort of, uh, even though we knew it was going to be hell, that we had to go out and do something with it. Um, but we kept our sense of humor. We published a book about it. A documentary film got made. And of course, you know, it changed my life completely. So we, we've never had a hit single, but we've had a hit lawsuit. So. <laughs> <laughs> Just you buy it or copy it? Yeah. <laughs> That's good. I don't know. It's very weird to meet the. You know. Yeah. Yeah. You. You. You destroyed my life, sir. <laughs> hey, I'm not. You're rich, and I'm not. It would have been have been out longer. Yeah, we would have liked if more people had gotten a hold of it. I, you know, for, to a certain extent, I'm sorry for running the I didn't intend that. I was just trying. I truly was confused as a consumer. I'm a YouTube fan, and I know the guys. You know, in their, in their management office. Sure. I talked to them. And said, do you know about this? And they went, No. And about ten minutes later, they called back and said, Would you send us a copy? I was going to say no. Of course, I'll send them a copy. Okay. Well. 
I'm glad you can fill you can fill us fill me in a little more details. But I at least I know I was a good detective and I did figure you out. I nailed you. Okay. All right. 